Um, just as a brief introduction, introduction this call-in will address the recent victory in the Seventh Circuit for Whitaker versus Kenosha Unified School District and what it means for the future of trans rights. You will hear from four attorneys, including counsel on the case, as well as other legal experts. Before we get started, I just want to very quickly uh, talk a little bit about our speakers and then hand it off to our moderator, who will be Alana Turner. So, speaking first about Alana, she is co-counsel in this matter, and she is the legal director of Transgender Law Center, the largest national organization dedicated to advancing the rights of transgender and gender nonconforming people. The, organiz the organization's litigation and policy advocacy focuses on schools, identity documents, healthcare and employment, as well as conditions for transgender people in prisons, jails, and immigration detention. Alana previously worked as a staff attorney at the National Center for Lesbian Rights with Shannon, who was one of her other speakers, and as the lobbyist for Equality California. She has written numerous articles on transgender and LGBT rights issues. She received her JD from the University of California Berkeley School of Law, and we're so thankful that she's joining us here today. One of our other speakers is Joseph Wardensky, who is counsel at Relman, Dane, and Koufax. Joe practiced primarily in civil rights litigation and is also counsel on the case at hand. Prior to joining his, joining his firm, Joe served as a trial attorney in the Educational Opportunity Section of the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, where he was lead attorney on, very, on a variety of matters enforcing federal civil rights laws protecting students in public schools, colleges, and universities from discrimination. While at the Justice Department, he also served as co-chair of the Civil Rights Division's Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and Intersex Working Group. Previously, he was a litigation associate at Davis, Polk, and Wardell in New York. And as previously mentioned, we also have Shannon Minter uh, on the line, who is a legal director for the National Center for Lesbian Rights. Shannon is a longtime LGBT advocate and has served as lead counsel for a number of high-profile cases, including the 2009 Proposition 8 case in the California Supreme Court and Christian Legal Society v. Hastings. Minter has been the recipient of a number of awards, including California Attorney of the Year in 2009, and was listed as one of six Lawyers of the Year by Lawyers USA. And very lastly, but certainly not least, we have Josh Block, who is a staff attorney at the ACLU. Uh, Josh uh, is a staff attorney with the National ACLU uh, LGBT and HIV projects. Josh was a member of the legal team that litigated Obergefell and Windsor before the Supreme Court, and he has litigated cases seeking marriage for same-sex couples in several states, including Kansas, Missouri, Utah, and Virginia. Josh's litigation docket covers a wide range of issues, including employment discrimination, attempts to use religion to discriminate, access to health care for transgender people, military service and censorship, and free speech. In 2012, he was named one of the best LGBT lawyers under 40 by the LGBT Bar Association. So I just wanted to quickly give that summary of our speakers. And um, just right before I pass it off to Alana, I want to say that if any of our listeners have questions for our speakers, please email them to me at paul at lgbtbar.org. That's paul at lgbtbar.org. And we will be sure to try to get to them at the end of the call. So with that, Alana, I pass it off to you to start this uh, really great discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, again, I'm Ilona Turner, Legal Director at the Transgender Law Center and one of the attorneys on the Ash Whitaker case. And it was such an honor to be able to work on this case and really thankful to the National LGBT Bar Association for uh, hosting this call and um, doing it alongside Transgender Law Center and really excited to be here with all my esteemed colleagues um, and friends. Uh, we work together on a lot of things and um, really happy to talk to you all today. Um, so I wanted to start by telling you a little bit about our client, Ash Whitaker, and what happened to him leading up to this case. So his birth certificate said female when he was born, but Ash had known that he was a boy for many years and had been living as a boy and recognized as a boy by all his peers uh, since early in high school. And starting at the beginning of his junior year, he used the boys' restroom at school consistently for around six months without anybody noticing or caring, until one day a teacher caught him washing his hands at a sink. And from then on, they targeted him, his administrators at the school targeted him for a really consistent campaign of harassment, singling him out and monitoring his every move. His school insisted that he was a girl and said that he had to use a separate bathroom from all other students, and one that he needed a key to get into. Administrators would pull him out of class, 
almost weekly. Uh, they told security guards to monitor which bathroom he used, and they even proposed making transgender students wear green armbands so that they could more easily keep an eye on them, and, and in particular on Ash. So this was obviously incredibly embarrassing, scary, and really humiliating for Ash. Um, he had the support of his peers, um, you know, many of whom actually staged a sit-in in the school's office over the way that they were treating Ash. Um, but, you know, just a few adults with all the power at the school really singled him out and had the power to, to make him feel isolated and alone in all of this. And the way that they treated him led to really horrible impacts for his mental health and his physical health as he, he stopped drinking liquids at school and then had a host of health problems related to that, related to the dehydration that obviously resulted, uh, and he became increasingly depressed, anxious, and honestly even suicidal. So really serious effects. Um, and you know, no kid should have to go through that, and, and unfortunately these are things that we hear pretty regularly you want to tell us a little bit more about the narrative of the case while Alana probably tries to get back on? Uh, sure, this is Joe. Uh, this is Joe Wardensky. I'm uh, one of Ash's attorneys. Uh, I'm an attorney at Roman Dane and Colfax in Washington, D.C. We're a national civil rights law firm, uh, and we've been very pleased to co-counsel with the Transgender Law Center uh, on this case. Um, Alona was uh, talking about the, the facts of Ash's case uh, and uh, really uh, what a nightmare his junior year was uh, after uh, Tremper High School and the Kenosha School District decided to start singling him out for um, refusing him access to boys' restrooms, threatening him with discipline if he were to use the restrooms, uh, surveilling him uh, to make sure he, he wasn't using them, uh, and it was causing him uh, significant and profound harm uh, both emotionally and physically. And so we filed a lawsuit on Ash's behalf uh, with TLC last July, and we sought a preliminary injunction in August uh, asking the district court to uh, enjoin the school district from banning Ash from boys' restrooms while the case proceeded on the merits. Um, and Judge Pepper, Pamela, Judge Pamela Pepper in the Eastern District of Wisconsin on September 22nd uh, issued uh, the injunction uh, finding that Ash would be harmed uh, if the district discrimination continued um, and that uh, the injunction was proper uh, because he was likely to prevail under both Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972, which everyone knows as Title IX, the federal sex discrimination law prohibiting uh, discrimination based on sex in public schools, uh, and also under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, so the school district appealed that decision. Uh, they also sought a stay of uh, the injunction, which both the district court and the Seventh Circuit denied last fall. And so the, the good news is that uh, the injunction was in place for almost all of the current school year, uh, and Ash has been able to use boys' restrooms and, more importantly, be a normal senior uh, where he can focus and has focused on his college applications, his senior year coursework, his after-school activities, uh, and not on whether school administrators are watching him um, or prohibiting from using uh, boys' restrooms. So uh, we argued, uh, I argued the case for Ash before the Seventh Circuit on March 29th. Uh, the panel was uh, Chief Judge Diane Wood, Judge Ann Claire Williams, and Judge Alana Rovner. Uh, and uh, the decision uh, was issued last week on uh, May 30th. The, it was a unanimous opinion affirming the preliminary injunction that was authored by Judge Williams. Uh, and the opinion squarely rejected each of the Kenosha School District's arguments and made clear that on the undisputed facts on the record, uh, the Kenosha School District's dis discrimination against Ash violated the law. So I'll take a few minutes to uh, discuss some of the highlights of Judge Williams' powerful decision uh, in the case uh, and the impact that it will have both on Ash, uh, other transgender students, and for uh, transgender individuals facing discrimination more broadly. So as Alona mentioned, uh, Ash was suffering from severe depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, 
and fainting and migraines from uh, dehydration because he was avoiding drinking water during the day to avoid having to use uh, the restroom. And we submitted uh, a declaration from Stephanie Budge, a clinical psychologist and professor at the University of Wisconsin, uh, with our injunction motion last summer, uh, showing that he uh, that Ash suffered the risk of, a, of lifelong harms to his health and well-being if the discriminatory conduct continued this year. The Seventh Circuit uh, agreed uh, with the district court's findings that Ash would suffer irreparable harm uh, if the injunction had not been would have suffered irreparable harm had the injunction not issued last fall, and they rejected Kenosha's argument that his injuries were. Uh, self-inflicted because they had made a handful of single occupancy restrooms available to him and him alone to use under lock and key. And I'll quote the, the court's opinion. The school district's argument that Ash's harm was self-inflicted because he chose not to use the gender-neutral restrooms fails to comprehend the harm that Ash has identified. The school district actually exacerbated the harm by relegating him alone to a separate bathroom and further stigmatized Ash by indicating that he was different because he was a transgender boy. The court also rejected KUSD's arguments that Ash's injuries were compensable uh, in damages. Uh, the court said, uh, we cannot say that this potential harm, his suicide, among other things, can be compensated by monetary damages, nor is there any adequate remedy for preventable lifelong diminished well-being and life functioning. In contrast to the harms that Ash would clearly suffer had the injunction not issued uh, last fall, the court agreed with the district court that there was absolutely no evidence of any harm to the Kenosha School District, its students, or anyone else resulting from Ash's use of the boys' restrooms this year. The court then moved on to, uh, to assess whether Ash had a likelihood of success on the merits of his two claims, his statutory claim under Title IX and his constitutional claim under the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, and the, the Court of Appeals found that Ash is likely to see, succeed under both Title IX and the 14th Amendment. Um, with respect to Title IX, the court found that KUSD's discriminatory restroom policies uh, violated Title IX under the sex stereotyping theory first announced in the Supreme Court's decision in Price Waterhouse v. Hopkins in 1989. Uh, the, the court wrote, by definition, a transgender individual does not conform to the sex-based stereotypes of the sex that he or, sh or she was assigned at birth. A policy that requires an individual to use a bathroom that does not conform with his or her gender identity punishes that individual for his or her gender nonconformance, which in turn violates Title IX. Uh, this, uh, this statement that I just read changes the law in the Seventh Circuit with regard to uh, the ability of transgender people to bring sex discrimination claims uh, in the jurisdiction covered by the Seventh Circuit, which is Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana. Uh, before this, uh, there was a 1984 case, Ulane versus Eastern Airlines, in which the Seventh Circuit uh, held that trans, uh, what they called transsexuals were not covered by Title VII's prohibitions on sex discrimination and, and employment. And the Kenosha School District attempted to rely on Ulane here. Uh, the, the panel said that uh, although uh, Ulane, uh, the panel recognized that uh, Ulane um, said what it said, but it also found that it had no bearing on Ash's claims because of Price Waterhouse's, um, uh, because of the sex stereotyping theory announced in Price Waterhouse four years later. So it essentially recognized, uh, or recognized that Ulane has been abrogated and is no longer good law in the Seventh Circuit, which opens the door for transgender plaintiffs to bring cases both under Title IX, but also under Title VII and other sex, uh, federal sex discrimination laws like the Fair Housing Act and others. Um, the court then moved on to the Equal Protection Clause claim, uh, and it applied heightened scrutiny uh, because uh, it said that the school district's policy is inherently based upon a sex classification and therefore heightened scrutiny applies. The, uh, the court rejected the school district's purported privacy rationale. They had said that Ash's use of restrooms uh, violates every other student's privacy in the 22,000 student school district, uh, which the court uh, just dismissed uh, altogether. It said that the district's privacy argument is based upon sheer conjecture and abstraction 
and that a transgender student's presence in the restroom provides no more of a risk to other students' privacy than the presence of an overly curious student of the same biological sex, or for that matter, any other student who uses the bathroom at the same time. Uh, the court also rejected the, uh, the school district's purported policy uh, requiring or regulating restroom use by the sex marker on one's birth certificate. Um, that was not actually the policy. Uh, there is no policy. There, it's, it's an unwritten policy at best, um, which the court recognized, but it found that the, um, the district's current claim that it um, is assigning students to restrooms based on the sex on their birth certificate is arbitrary and uh, does not advance a, an important governmental interest, uh, in part because the district doesn't even require birth certificates to enroll in school, um, that kids like Ash and other states like Minnesota could get their birth certificate changed uh, and move to Kenosha and would um, be otherwise similarly situated, uh, that he could obtain a passport uh, that recognizes his male sex and that uh, there is simply no, uh, no evidence that a birth certificate is a proxy for one's actual biological sex, recognizing that there is, um, you know, what one's sex is is a much more uh, complicated question than simply the gender marker on your birth certificate. So we consider all of this a resounding victory um, and certainly will are ready to proceed with the case. The district hasn't announced what it um, will do, whether it will seek um, bonk review from the Seventh Circuit or uh, uh, petition for cert to the Supreme Court, um, but we hope that we'll be able to return to discovery and uh, try the case on the merits given the, the powerful decision from the Seventh Circuit. And I'll close by uh, giving a shout out to the amicus briefs that were filed uh, in the case, which really helped inform the court and I think uh, strengthened the overall decision. The Williams Institute uh, filed a brief on behalf of a number of LGBT scholars uh, and the, the court at oral argument um, brought up and uh, we discussed those statistics and the evidence of uh, pernicious discrimination, pervasive uh, and pernicious discrimination against trans people generally and trans students, uh, particularly in the area covered by uh, the Seventh Circuit. The court in its decision also referenced uh, the statements of school administrators from a number of school districts around the country that submitted an amicus brief um, covering school districts that serve something like 1.4 million students and uh, said from a practical standpoint that none of the school none of the Kenosha school districts fears of harm uh, have been borne out in any of the real world experiences of school administrators who have adopted trans inclusive policies and have found them um, to be successful uh, to, and to be uh, th that promoting equality for trans students uh, actually benefits both those students and all students in their school districts. Uh, and the court really um, uh, gave some credit to uh, those statements. We also had amicus briefs from uh, parents and, uh, of transgender students uh, in the three states, Indiana, Wisconsin, and Illinois, as well as students, um, as well as from the National Women's Law Center talking uh, and other women's groups. And uh, the, the collection of those voices was very important and we're very grateful for the support um, that a number of national and local groups gave to the case. Um, and certainly for Ash, who uh, it turns out his last day of school was Wednesday. Um, the day after the decision issued and he graduated uh, from high school on Saturday. So it was quite a last week of school for him and a real graduation gift um, from the Seventh Circuit to allow him to uh, move forward and go to college next year. Great. Thanks so much, Joe. Uh, that was a great summary of the decision and, you know, what was so important about it. Um, I'm wondering if Josh or Shannon would like to add anything about their impressions of the decision. Um, Shannon, anything to add? Uh, just, sure, just really quickly. Well, I uh, what I really wanted to say is um, that, that uh, Joe did an amazing job at oral argument. Really, it was one of the just smoothest, best, most powerful presentations of these issues I, I've ever seen anyone do, and it was just it was a delight to watch. And um, a lot of you all at TLC and the and Joe, your firm of Roman, Dane, and Colfax did just really an outstanding job on the case. The only thing I would say that hasn't been said about the decision is it was so great that I think the the uh, panel really just understood the human side of this issue, and they really got who Ash is and that he's just a boy. And they and I was um, interested that they 
uh, were also impressed, I think, or, or noted that this is a problem that was really cooked up artificially, that the students had no issue with ASH, and we see that all over the country. That's reflected in the administrator brief. Really, this is an issue where if uh, anti-LGBT groups would just kind of stay out of the picture, I think we would have, there would almost be no issue, because most school districts are willing to do the right thing, and when they do, it works out with no problems. Thank you. That's a great point. Um, Josh? You want to jump in? Yeah. Um, so I want to echo everything that that Shannon said. Um, I think that you know the decision also has ramifications uh, beyond the specific context of access to facilities, um, because it really you know finally uh, drove a stake through the heart of U Lane, which had been standing out there as a terrible precedent, not just in the Seventh Circuit, but as a precedent that courts elsewhere continue to cling to, to deny protections uh, to trans people. And and having uh, the Seventh Circuit repudiate uh, Ulane the way it did is, is a huge uh, victory that is going to have enormous consequences. The, the other yeah. thing I wanted oh. to... I was just, sorry. I was just going to, I was just going to tag on to that to say, I totally agree. And it's something that we see, certainly we see Ulane cited by other um, parties, you know, by like defendants in our in a variety of cases all the time. But but I would push back on the idea that courts regularly embrace it. I think that it's that the momentum is very much in our favor, and we generally are winning these cases in courts. It's just there's always the the fear, the specter of the, those bad old decisions like Elaine out there. And so I agree, it is going to make a huge difference in taking away that potential weapon from our opponents. And, and the other thing I wanted to just highlight about the decision is, so this is, um, so I, I, I'm, I work on the on Gavin Grimm's case, and this is the first decision to come out since the Supreme Court sent the issue, sent Gavin's case back down to the lower courts. Um, so up until now, all these cases have been sort of analyzed, you know, through the lens of deference to the Obama interpretation and things like that. And this is just a ringing endorsement of the rights of trans kids under both um, Title IX and the Equal Protection Clause without any deference to any administration at all. This is just makes clear this is what the statute means and what the Constitution means. It's what they've always meant. Um, and I think that that firm uh, holding is going to be very influential in setting the path going forward. Yeah, thanks so much, Josh. Um, do you want to maybe? I know people have a lot of people have been following the Gavin Grimm case very closely and your work on it. Do you want to just maybe give like a two minute or less um, sort of summary refresher about what happened, especially like over the last few months and where the case is now? Sure. So you know, as I mentioned before, you know, the Gavin's case before now was decided by uh, on Title IX by deferring to the Obama administration's interpretation of its own Title IX regulation. And when that was withdrawn, that interpretation was withdrawn by the new administration, the Supreme Court sent the case back down to the Fourth Circuit to now decide for itself without any deference, what does Title IX mean? Um, and we have, the parties have completed supplemental briefing on that. The case is scheduled for, for oral argument during the September sitting, which is will be September 12th through September 15th. And you know the argument is under both Title IX and the Equal Protection Clause. And Whitaker is definitely going to be a, a huge uh, precedent uh, that will be in our favor during that argument. Yeah. But fingers crossed. Um, and I'll just also add that um, Gavin has been a huge role model um, and inspiration for Ash. And uh, a couple months ago, we were able to put them in touch um, through you and your colleagues. And that just meant the world to Ash and, and I think really helped him. Their stories are so similar. They're both seniors in high school, both trans boys experiencing really similar issues at school. Um, and I'm so glad they were able to kind of go through this experience somewhat together. Um, so
So Shannon, I'm wondering if you want to, I know you all have actually another somewhat similar case pending in the Sixth Circuit. If you want to say anything about that or, or anything else before we sure. turn over to questions. Yeah. Yeah. You bet. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick too. Um, yeah, we represent yet another transgender student. Uh, this time it's a transgender girl, and she's a bit younger too. Uh, she was in. Uh, she is in the fifth grade. She's just completing the fifth grade, and uh, she uh, goes to school in um, middle school in Ohio, and uh, has great supportive parents and we have been working with her and her family um, for for more than a year uh, to try to get the school district to do the right thing and just simply treat her the same as other girls and let her use the girls restroom in particular and uh, we were not able to prevail upon them to do that and eventually did have to uh, file a lawsuit and it was just you know, she was really suffering, uh, much as Gavin and, and Ash did by being singled out. She's so young, too, and it was awful. Like, every day uh, the teacher would line up the girls on one side and the boys on the other side to go to the restroom. And our client, she's maintaining her privacy, so it was just known as Jane Doe. She would literally have to walk past both those lines of her classmates to go to a separate restroom. And it was really um, traumatizing to her. We got a wonderful decision from Judge Marbley in the Federal District Court uh, in Ohio, ruling both on uh, Title IX and Equal Protection grounds. The school has to treat her the same as other girls. So they've been doing that. Uh, the, the Sixth Circuit fortunately declined to stay the preliminary injunction that Judge Marbley issued. So uh, Jane has been having a great school year. She's doing really well, being able to uh, be treated the same as other students has made a world of difference to her, and she's doing well academically and emotionally in every other way. Uh, the school district, unfortunately, is appealing the decision to the Sixth Circuit, so our case is pending before the Sixth Circuit, but we just today asked the court uh, to uh, delay the briefing schedule to see if we can possibly work out a settlement with the school district, so fingers crossed that would obviously be the best thing for for Jane to not have to go through more litigation, so we'll we'll just have to see how the case comes out. But another, as you pointed out, Alona, you know, yet another uh, successful instance of the courts recognizing that, uh, you know, that of course this is sex discrimination and being able to understand the harm that is causing these students and reaching the right result. Great, thanks so much, Shannon, um, and thanks for your great work on that case. It's it is already providing very helpful precedent um, that led in part to this decision from the Seventh Circuit. Um, so uh, I think that we perhaps could turn it back to Paul to get some, uh, in case there are questions that have come in. Do you want to repeat maybe the email address for people to send questions? Sure, I have gotten a couple, but of course, um, if anyone has any more, please feel free to send them over. Uh, my email is paul, P-A-U-L, at lgbtbar.org. Uh, that's paul at lgbtbar.org. And if you want, um, I can just send the, I can read the couple that I've gotten so far, and we can take it from there. Um, the first one that I have gotten, which I, I don't know, perhaps this is really for Josh, it's asking uh, for a little bit more information on how this case could impact uh, Gavin Grimm's matter in the fourth. I'd be happy to do that. I mean, so this case is, in in a lot of respects, um, uh, an indistinguishable uh, fact pattern. I mean, there 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 can be teeny tiny ways where you could try to draw distinctions between you know Ash's legal claims and, and Gavin's, but it's uh, directly on point, um, holding that excluding uh, trans boys from using the same restrooms as other boys discriminates against them on the basis of sex under Title IX and under the Equal Protection Clause. Um, and so, you know, uh, the claims before the Fourth Circuit are, was the district court wrong to dismiss Gavin's Title IX claim? And uh, was the district court wrong to deny Gavin a preliminary injunction on both Equal Protection and Title IX? And so, on and the Whitaker came down, I think, two days before our reply brief was due, and we spent a lot of time saying, see Whitaker um, at the end of, you know, or throughout every section. So I think um, it'll be, you know, extremely relevant uh, for Gavin. 
Awesome. Um, thanks for giving us some more clarity on that. I don't know, does anybody else have anything else to add to that? Or I've actually just received a couple more questions. So I can move on to the next one as well. Okay, I guess I'll, the next question on this list is, um, Ash is set to graduate soon. Will this affect anything? Uh, so this is Joe. Ash uh, actually graduated on Saturday, um, and he will be going to the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the fall. Um, the case has uh, is seeking damages, and um, so we will be proceeding. The injunction is obviously over because he's no longer a student in the school, um, but the, the case is still alive, and we expect to return to discovery, which we had already begun uh, soon, and uh, expect there may be a trial um, as early as uh, sometime early in 2018, uh, if we get that far. Um, the, other, the other point, and I think this is true in uh, Gavin's case too, is that Ash uh, is an alum of this school district and his mom works at his high, the, the high school, um, so he will have occasion to go back to the school in the future, and so there may be um, some more limited claim for permanent injunctive relief for, for Ash himself in addition to uh, the damages claim that we have. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And this is Ilona. I'll also add that the preliminary injunction and the Seventh Circuit appeal and decision were solely about access to restrooms at school, the boys' restroom. Um, but there were actually a number of other issues and claims in the case um, about the, again, sort of systematic campaign of harassment and discrimination that the school engaged in, ranging from monitoring and, and harassing him around his restroom use. Um, they, it, his, a teacher nominated him to uh, be on the court for of candidates for prom king last spring, and the principal said no, he could only run for prom queen, which was obviously inappropriate and embarrassing and um, again sort of singled him out in a way that was totally uh, discriminatory. And um, they, and also the uh, proposal to require transgender students to wear green armbands or stickers to mark them out as transgender. So uh, all of those things are part of the claim for damages. Um, and alone, I would just add one more thing: is uh, overnight accommodations for school trips. Um, uh, Ash, what uh, part of the the complaint was that Ash went to a. Uh, a multi-day orchestra camp at one of the University of Wisconsin campuses um, with his uh, school orchestra uh, and was required last June for the whole camp to sleep in a room all by himself, even though every other student uh, slept in shared uh, suites with private bedrooms. Um, so he lost the benefits of um, you know, being able to socialize and, and be part of the group with his friends, and so that's another piece of uh, his claim. Right, and at that camp, the the students were not allowed to enter other people's suites uh, after like 6 p.m. or something like that. So every evening, all of his friends and classmates were socializing together in their suites, and he was exiled to this room by himself to either sleep or practice the violin. Um, which is, you know, both in Ash's case, it's, you know, also a common issue for a lot of trans students um, that either, you know, singles them out and makes them feel ostracized on school trips or you know, compels them not to go on school trips at all. Um, and, and we've seen that in a lot of cases. Awesome. Um, actually, some questions are just rolling in now. So I'm going to try and get to as many as possible in the time that we have left. Um, and so this question is for really everyone. Um, it's directed towards Joe, but I think anyone could really help with this. And it's, uh, what do you think is the likelihood that the Seventh Circuit will review en banc if, districts, if the district so moves? If instead they appeal, do you think SCOTUS, do you hear that the Supreme Court will take cert? Uh, I think both things are very hard to predict. Um, they, they have uh, 14 days from the decision to petition for en banc review. Um, you know, I, I, the, the Seventh Circuit recently issued an en banc decision in the Hively versus Ivy Tech Community College case, which was a Title VII case on the question of whether sexual orientation discrimination is covered by, uh, is a covered form of sex discrimination under Title VII. Um, and a, a large majority of uh, the full court held that sexual orientation discrimination is covered as a form of sex discrimination under the, the same sex stereotyping theory uh, that the, the panel in the Whitaker case um, 
held apply to trans students in Title IX. So, you know, I think the the court has already spoken clearly, both this panel and the court at large, that federal sex discrimination laws must be construed very broadly. Um, and so I, I would suspect the court, you know, would not take um, this case on bonk, but, you know, obviously hard to predict that. Um, you know, our, our hope is that the school district will take the fact that there have been now two federal courts uh, that have t come down clearly on Ash's side and spelled out what the law says um, to the extent that there was any question about that um, and that we can now, you know, move on um, and either proceed to trial or uh, resolve the case. Um, wh whether they, you know, petition for cert with the Supreme Court, um, you know, is unknown. Obviously, as I said, the preliminary injunction is over, Ash has graduated, and so um, our hope is that they will, uh, you know, allow the case to move on. But obviously, totally unclear what the court, would, the Supreme Court, would do if there was a cert petition. Um, awesome. Does Does anyone else have anything else that they want to to add to that? Because um, if not, I can move on to the next question too. Okay. Well, the next question that uh, I received was. Uh, this caller is wondering if the if the attorneys could speak at all on the state of the law as it pertains to students at private and or religious schools. Are there any decisions or case law finding protection for students there? So th this so is Josh. I'm not sure. So you, uh, th I'll just say, uh, Title IX un unfortunately has an extremely broad exemption in it for religious schools. So it applies to private schools and when any school that, you know, accepts student loans or uh, like federal subsidized student loans is covered by Title IX, but religious schools can opt out of those protections um, if they choose to do so. Um, so that is a big, um, uh, unfortunately, a very large loophole um, with respect to Title IX. It does apply to other private schools, and if a religious school has not emptied out, opted out of uh, Title IX, it is obligated to comply with it. But um, there, there's a huge chunk of students that won't be protected at the federal level um, uh, through Title IX, and which is why it's still important to have uh, state and local protections as well. And this is Joe, I would just add for universities, um, uh, the, Fair, the Fair Housing Act also covers uh, on-campus housing. Um, so to the extent that there is discrimination in, in housing, uh, college students may also have a claim under the Fair Housing Act, which doesn't have um, a broad exemption like Title IX does. So it's, a, it's another possible avenue under federal law that um, hasn't been really litigated much, but is, is out there. Hey, real quick, this is Shannon. I just want to really quickly tag onto that, that even though there are limited um, protections for religious schools that if if you know of cases where someone, a transgender student is experiencing discrimination in one of those schools, it's still good to reach out because, uh, you know, some of these schools are trying to accommodate those students and can, you know, informal non-litigation advocacy can sometimes be successful. So it's still worth reaching out. Right. And this is Alona, you know, on that note, um, anybody who, you know, if you're a lawyer representing um, a student or family in this kind of situation or a family member yourself um, dealing with this, please, please reach out to one of our organizations or, or, or Joe's firm, um, you know, the Transgender Law Center, National Center for Lesbian Rights, or the ACLU, or our colleagues at Lambda Legal also do a lot of work on this. Um, so there, there's lots of help available. Um, so just please reach out. Yeah, and this is Joe. I would, I would, uh, I would just piggyback on that comment, Alona. That you know, in addition to litigating these cases, I think all of us on the line, um, uh, the three organizations in my firm, all are in the position to provide you know counseling and technical support to schools and institutions that want to do the right thing but haven't quite figured out how. Um, and so, uh, you know, the sort of technical assistance and, you know, compliance work uh, is, you know, I think is an important but probably unsung piece of this movement where there are a lot of school districts that really do want to do the, the right thing and build good inclusive policies. And, you know, if we can, you know, help anyone with that, I think everyone on this call would be, you know, willing to uh, talk to anyone. Awesome. Um, thanks for that and for those words there as well. Uh, I think we have time for 
one last question, so I'm going to pick this one, which, which we received, um, which was, uh, was there anything in the court's written opinion which seems to indicate or provide guidance to the lower court in how to rule when they rehear the matter? So Alona, I'm not sure if, if maybe you wanna take a first stab at answering that. Sure, I mean, it. it's not so much rehearing the matter um, as, as going on to rule on the remaining issues in the case, but I mean, the whole thing was so uh, resoundingly powerful and a vindication of everything that we had argued on behalf of Ash. So I think that it very clearly supports the ruling that the district court judge made back in September on on both the preliminary injunction and also her denial of the motion to dismiss and sends a pretty strong signal that, that she's on the right track and that what they did to, to Ash in general and singling out any transgender student in this kind of way is illegal. Yeah, this is Joe. I agree with that. Um, I, I think for Title IX, they, you know, the, the court said um, in a declarative statement that a policy that segregates transgender students um, because of their gender identity violates Title IX. So, you know, on the undisputed facts here, the school district doesn't deny that this is their practice, um, that uh, the Seventh Circuit has held they violated the law. So moving forward, there may be questions about you know, sort of the extent of the harm to Ash and what his damages are, but really as far as the, the policy at issue, uh, the Seventh Circuit came down very clearly that the district already violated the law um, based on what we already know. Right, and they found, you know, and said repeatedly, Ash is a boy, and everything that the school district did to Ash was premised on the idea that he's not a boy, that he's a girl, and that, you know, he should be treated like a girl. So that really applies to everything that they did and shows that it's, it was all illegal and discriminatory. Awesome, and uh, Shannon or Josh, do you have anything to add? You know, just that, um, I think Alona just nailed it. I mean, and I think I said it before actually, but what's so encouraging is just that courts are really recognizing that these cases actually for all the hoopla and the political controversy that is really drummed up very artificially by right-wing groups, these cases are really simple. All school districts have to do is treat transgender boys like boys and transgender girls like girls, and that's pretty much uh, the sum total of it. Very cool. Um, so I guess I guess I'll, I'll just leave this one last minute for if anyone has any final thoughts, you know, please we'd love to hear them. And if not, I will wrap it up. So um, does anyone have any any last thoughts that they wish to speak? Okay. So with that, I just want to uh, thank our panelists so much, uh, Alona, um, Josh, uh, um, Shannon, and. And Joe, all of you, thank you so much for for uh, calling in and helping us out today. And same with our call for our uh, everyone who called in to listen. Uh, the National LGBT Bar Association cannot continue to put together quality programming like this call without your continued support and with the support of other organizations like we've had today. If you'd like to see more cutting edge legal analysis, please consider becoming a member of the bar or renewing your existing membership. To learn more, please visit our website at lgbtbar.org. Thank you, and thanks again for everyone for, for participating.